Can't sleep? Won't sleep? Afraid to sleep? Perhaps what you need is a story, a bedtime story, to lull you into the world of dreams, or maybe nightmares. Are the windows closed? Are your doors locked? Maybe you should keep a light on in the hallway, just in case. Now settle in, make yourself comfortable, lay back, close your eyes, and let me tell you a story. Monsters are everywhere, under our beds, hiding in our closets, lurking in the woods and haunting our imaginations. Hank Newsom, according to our legal system, is a bit of a monster himself, flaunting our laws and on the run after escaping punishment. Sometimes it takes a monster to catch a monster. The Gargoyle's Bread Hank Newsom raced down the lonely two-lane highway in the car he had stolen shortly after breaking out of the state penitentiary. The escape had been simple. Underpaid guards were easy to bribe, and Hank had enough cash stashed from the robbery that had landed him in prison to make it worth their while. The ethically challenged lawyer who had tried to defend his hopeless case was at least reliable enough to manage his ill-begotten gains and arrange the payoffs. Now he had to make it out of the state, and eventually out of the country, to a non-extradition jurisdiction, preferably one with lots of beaches. He was on his own at this point, but he was confident he could elude the state police and the U.S. Marshals, as long as he didn't take too many chances. Stealing this car had been one that was necessary. He needed to get as far away as fast as possible. The car had been parked behind a bar. Judging by the supply of makeup products in the glove compartment, he assumed it had belonged to one of the waitresses. Hopefully she would notice it was missing until the bar closed, which gave him a good six or eight hours to make tracks. The sun was starting to set on the cold, windy autumn day. He had a full tank of gas and planned on driving through the night along the lightly traveled roads that crisscrossed the rural landscape. He was starting to wish he had stopped inside the bar to get something to eat, as his stomach was growling, reminding him that he hadn't had anything since the previous day's dinner. The speed limit was laughably posted at 55 miles per hour, a legacy from a decades-old effort to save gas, but Hank kept the speedometer on the high side of 90 most of the way, kicking up a cloud of dust in his wake. When the tire blew, Hank had no chance to put the vehicle under control. The car pulled toward the gravel shoulder, where a pothole caught the front wheel and set the old Dodge tumbling bumper over fender down the road like a sky-blue sheet metal tumbleweed. When he awoke, Hank was no longer in the car. He was lying in a dead bush, its thorny branches poking and scratching him with every movement. He tested his limbs. His knees felt like someone had taken a baseball bat to the joints, but he was able to bend them. There was a gash on his right arm that was bleeding profusely. He tried to reach over and put pressure on the wound with his left hand, but when he tried to bend that arm, there was a piercing pain between his wrist and elbow. Bone protruded from the flesh. Any movement was agony. Hank lifted his head until he could see around him. He was in a gully. About twenty feet away was the car, resting upside down. He couldn't see the road from where he was, so it was likely any vehicles passing by couldn't see him either. On the horizon, he could see storm clouds approaching. He tried to sit up. Thorns pressed into the underside of his legs. He used his right arm to push himself up, then rolled over onto his battered knees, keeping his left arm tucked against his body to minimize the motion. He lifted himself to a three-point crouch, then stood up. A wave of vertigo nearly caused him to topple over. He lowered himself to one knee. Blood was still pouring from the cut in his arm. When he looked closer, he could see a sliver of metal in the wound. With his left hand useless, he bent down to his forearm and clutched the strip of steel between his teeth. He started to pull it out slowly, but each fraction of an inch felt like fire. He made sure he had a tight grip on the metal with his teeth, then pulled his head back and ripped it out. It turned out the sliver was more like a shard. A fresh gout of blood pulsed from the enlarged cut. Hank nearly passed out again. He bent his arm as tightly as he could, grabbing his shoulder with that hand to keep pressure on the wound. He wouldn't be able to keep that up for long, though. Hank slowly got back to his feet. He could see over the edge of the gully now. The road was empty, but flagging someone down was a risky proposition. 
he'd likely end up in a hospital, which would be one step away from going back to prison. He turned around to see what else was around him. In the distance, rising from the gently undulating prairie, was a great black tower, like something that had once been surrounded by a medieval castle. It was the only structure in sight, and hopefully there was someone who could help him staunch his wound. Setting his broken arm would be tricky, but if he could make it to the next state, he knew a doctor who would do the job without the usual paperwork. He took a few wobbly steps and managed to climb his way out of the gully and start limping toward the tower. It was getting colder as the approaching storm darkened the evening sky. At any moment, it would start to rain. The tower turned out to be farther away than he thought. As he approached, he could discern a battlement surrounding the top that extended past the rough stone walls. He thought he could see a light flickering somewhere behind the crenulated parapet. Hopefully that meant there was someone there. He would have to risk that someone calling the police, but at this point getting caught wouldn't be worse than dying. Fat raindrops began pelting him as he drew closer. Then the heavens opened up and a torrent of rain soaked him to the bone instantly. By the time he reached what he hoped was the entrance to the tower, there was nearly an inch of water washing over the hard ground, and a growing wind sent the icy droplets straight in his face. The door was set back into the wall, offering Hank a slight respite from the tempest howling around him. It was out of place in the rough hewn blocks of the tower, gleaming, windowless steel set on hinges on the outside of the building. Hank knew enough about doors to recognize that this was a big security mistake. An enterprising thief such as himself could cut the hinges off and remove the door so motivated. He knocked, then pounded on the thick steel. Its bulk absorbed his efforts, as if he was stomping on solid rock. He reached for the door handle. It was a lever-type latch, one that you pressed down on with your thumb and pulled open. To a surprise, it opened freely. He quickly folded his arm back against his chest to stop the fresh flow of blood. Hank stepped inside. The hallway within was dimly lit with candles and sconces along the wall. Hello, he shouted. There was no reply. He took a few steps inside as the door started to swing shut behind him. Is there anyone here? I need help. The hallway seemed to grow dimmer as Hank felt lightheaded and dropped to his knees. A figure appeared in the hallway before him. A man in a plain brown robe cinched around the waist with a white rope. His face bore an expression of panic as he seemed to stare past Hank toward the door behind him. The man ran toward the door but it clicked shut before he could reach it. Hank lowered himself to the ground. The pressure he'd been putting on the gash on his arm lessened, and he could feel the warm blood pool on his chest as the world faded to black. When he awoke, he was lying on a cot, the type with canvas stretched across a wooden frame. He immediately felt hungry, then remembered the accident and the injuries he had suffered. Hank lifted his arms. The broken one had been set and splinted and rested in a sling. The one had been pierced by a shard of metal was bandaged. There was a little bit of blood soaking the coarse woolen fabric wrapped tightly around his forearm, but not a lot, and he suspected someone had crudely stitched up the wound before dressing it. Slowly he sat up. He wore a plain brown robe identical to the one worn by the man he had seen before passing out. All of his other clothing and shoes and socks had been removed, but there was a pair of leather sandals strapped to his feet. He looked around the room and spotted a bundle of clothing sitting on a stool near the open door, his shoes beneath it. How long had he been out? Had his car been discovered? Had the man who helped him called the police? He wasn't in a hospital or jail, so there was still a chance he could make good his escape. The man from earlier appeared in the doorway carrying a tray laden with a wooden pitcher and cup. He saw Hank trying to lift himself off the flimsy cot and ran to the injured man's side, setting the tray down on a small wooden table. He grabbed Hank as he started to collapse back onto the cot. Hank could see clearly now that the man was a monk. In addition to the robe, he wore a wooden cross on a loop of rawhide around his neck. He eased Hank back down. Thank you, Hank said coarsely. He looked up at his benefactor, who smiled and nodded, then poured some water into the wooden cup and offered it to Hank. Hank accepted the cup and poured the cool water over his parched tongue. It was difficult to swallow at first, but once he got the first sip down, it became easier. He handed the cup back to the monk. Where am I? he asked. The monk looked around the room as if the answer was obvious. Yes, I know I'm in a room, but where? What is this place? Hink's host seemed at a loss on how to explain it further. Listen, I'm guessing you're one of those vow of silence monks, but there's no one else around. If you want to just tell me, that might save a lot of time. The monk shook his head vigorously. 
Hink sighed, then realized that might work to his advantage. So that means you haven't called for help? The monk sadly indicated he hadn't. No email? No texts? Again, the monk dismissed Hink's questions with a shake of his head. You did this? Hink asked, raising his bandaged arm. The monk nodded enthusiastically, miming a sewing motion, confirming Hink's assessment. Thank you. You probably saved my life. I was in an accident out on the highway. You wouldn't happen to have a car I could borrow, do you? The monk slowly shook his head. Yeah, I didn't think so. How long was I out? The monk held up five fingers on one hand and four on the other. Nine hours? Another affirming nod. Shit, pardon my French. I appreciate your help, but I really need to get going. Hank tried to lift himself up again, more slowly this time, and managed to stand unsteadily. The monk placed his hands together, held them up to the side of his head, and closed his eyes. I've already slept nine hours, Hank countered. I really need to be on my way. If you can just point me in the direction of the nearest town, I'll get out of your hair. It wasn't ideal, but he needed to keep moving. Eventually, someone would find the stolen car, connect it with the breakout from prison, and refocus the search for Hank to this area. The monk expressed his reluctance. Hank took a tentative step. His left knee threatened to buckle under him, but he managed to reach out and put a hand on the monk's shoulder to steady himself. He limped carefully toward the stool by the door where his now dry clothes sat, his strength growing with each step, but he quickly realized the effort of getting dressed was more than he was ready for at the moment. Food? Hank asked, his hunger reawakening. I need something to eat. Need to get my strength back. The monk again mimed that Hank should sleep. He ignored his host and walked out of the room, bracing himself against the cold stone walls. The monk ran ahead of Hank, directing him to take a right turn out the door to the small room. To the left was a stairway that led upwards. Hank looked in that direction, but the monk urged him to keep moving away from it. At the end of the hall was a sparse kitchen. There was a loaf of bread on the plain wooden table in the center of the room. Can you spare me some of that bread, brother? Hank asked as he limped toward the table and reached for the loaf. The monk moved with surprising speed to cut Hank off. He snatched the bread off the table and cradled it against his chest. I just want a little bit. I can pay you, he said, reaching into his pocket for the wad of cash he had for gas and food before realizing he wasn't wearing his own clothes. The barobed friar turned away, holding the loaf close. What's wrong with you? Hank asked. I just want something to eat. The monk shook his head vigorously. Hank found himself getting angry. What reason could this misguided Samaritan have to tend to his wounds, but then deny him the most basic sustenance? He leant toward his reluctant host. Give me that bread, he insisted. The monk tried to escape the close confines of the kitchen, but Hank grabbed the coarse fabric of his robe and pulled the man toward him. He grabbed at the bread, and the two of them struggled over the loaf until Hank tore away a heel, much to the horror of the monk. What is your problem? the escaped convict asked. He glared at the monk while he lifted the hunk of bread to his mouth. The monk's eyes widened, and his mouth gaped in horror. Hank paused, then looked down at the bread. Inside the crust, the crumb was soaked with a crimson liquid. Hank dropped the heel and stumbled back away from it. Is that blood? he asked, as the liquid spilled onto the stone floor. The monk bowed his head. Why? Hank asked. What's wrong with you? The monk's posture sank in an expression of shame. He put the remainder of the ensanguined loaf in the sink, then picked up a candle from the table and walked back out into the hallway. Hank paused as his eyes were drawn to a long knife on the counter. He picked it up, slid it into the sling holding his broken arm, then followed as the brother exited the kitchen. He led Hank toward an alcove, where there appeared to be a mural of some sort painted on the stone wall. There was a row of candles in front of it. The monk lit them with the flame from the taper he held. The flickering light revealed a sequence of scenes that told a disturbing story of a demon terrorizing worshippers at a church, then the same creature being battled by cross-bearing monks and finally imprisoned in a tall, square tower. A second sequence revealed the creature in chains, drinking blood from the body of a beheaded monk, then another monk teaching his brothers to put blood in a loaf of bread, and finally a quiescent demon satisfied with the offering. You're trying to tell me that you've got some sort of demon trapped in this tower? And you have to make that blood bread to what? Keep her from escaping? The monk nodded enthusiastically. You are completely Looney Tunes mad as I had her crazy, Hank said. Look, I really don't care what you're doing here, but I have to go. 
So if you do have any food that's not soaked in blood, I would really appreciate it. Hank's host shook his head. Nothing else? What do you use to make the bread? The monk tried to think of a way to explain the answer to the question. Hank grunted in frustration, then turned around and headed back toward the kitchen. He threw open cabinets and drawers, tossed their sparse contents under the floor. He found wooden bowls, spoons, and cups, a few other knives. They were all the accoutrements to make bread, but none of the ingredients. He howled in frustration. The exertion weakened him. He felt lightheaded and started to collapse to the floor, but suddenly the monk was at his side, holding him up and guiding him to a chair. You must have something, anything, Hank pleaded. The monk shrugged apologetically. I have to go. I can't stay here any longer. I need to find something to eat. Do you have anything I can use? A bicycle? A skateboard? The monk shook his head. Of course not. Fine, I'll walk. Just give me some water. I know you have that. His host nodded and picked up one of the wooden cups Hank had scattered on the floor and carried it to the stone sink that had a hand pump next to it, filled the cup, and brought it to Hank. Hank drank it eagerly. It was cold and satisfying. You could feel some of his vertigo fading. Thank you. More, please. The monk took the cup, refilled it, and Hank emptied it again. He raised himself to his feet and paused to make sure he wasn't going to pass out. Then he walked slowly out of the kitchen, navigating the dim hallways until he saw the giant steel door he had come in by. There was an electronic keypad where the door handle should have been. Hank poked at the keys, and digits lit up on a display, glowing red. After he had entered eight numbers, the device issued a dissatisfied series of tones, and the glowing display went blank. Hank turned around and found the monk had followed him. What's the code? he demanded. The monk shrugged, a somber look on his face. You don't know the code to get out of here? Hank laughed. <laughs> Did I escape one prison just to get trapped in another? The monk shrugged, pointing down the hallway in the direction they had gone to view the murals. Oh, right, I forgot. You can't let the demon out. Well, how do you get what you need to make the bread? Where does the blood come from? The monk remained motionless, either unwilling or unable to respond. There has to be a way out of here, Hank insisted. If I can break out of a maximum security prison, I can certainly get out of a little stone monastery. He walked back down the hallway, finding the passage that led to the stairway he had seen earlier. The steps were dark. Hank grabbed a candle from one of the nearby sconces and started climbing the stairs. They seemed to ascend around the interior perimeter of the tower, seven full flights until he reached a door, a wooden door, one without any locks, just a crude latch. He opened it and stepped out onto the roof of the structure. In the center was a large brazier, in which a fire was burning, defying the wind and rain. Apparently the storm was still raging, but the fire seemed immune to it. Beyond the flames was a statue, a grand gargoyle resembling the demon in the mural, sculpted from the same dark rock that made up the walls of the tower. Hank stepped over to one of the gaps in the parapet and looked down. He was at least ten stories up, and there didn't seem to be any means to get down. A cold rain started to fall. Again, the monk appeared at Hank's side. Like the fire, he too seemed immune to the forceful gale. Do you have any rope? Hank asked. He tugged at the one that cinched his robe and held it before the monk. You must have more of this somewhere. The monk indicated his own simple belt. Hank looked at the statue. The fire seemed to bring it to life, but that was just a trick of the light. It was just stone. It's just a statue, Hank said to the monk. I don't get it. The monk pulled out the two pieces of the loaf Hank had torn apart from inside his robe and set them before the gargoyle. He seemed disappointed. Just tell me, Hank pleaded. What the hell is going on here? Why am I able to just walk in here, but you need a code to get out? Why is the only food you have blood-soaked bread? The monk walked up to the brazier and pulled a stick from the flames. He used the charred end to sketch a crude outline of the beast on the stone at their feet, and a small oval representing the loaf of bread. Then he drew an X over the bread and added a stick figure of a man. What does that mean? Hank asked. The monk just tapped at the stick figure emphatically. Hank's patience was at an end. He grabbed the monk's robe and pulled him close. I don't care about whatever vow of silence you took. Make an exception. Tell me how to get out of here or I swear to God I will kill you. Hank let go of the monk, then withdrew the knife he had hidden earlier in his sling. The monk seemed unpersuaded by the threat. He pointed at the drawing. It's not real, 
Hank shouted. He advanced on the monk until the simple man was standing at the edge of the brazier. Hank pressed the edge of the knife against the silent man's neck. The monk never even flinched. Hank unleashed his building fury. He drew the blade against the spot where the carotid artery was. The sharp blade cut deeply, slicing into the monk's neck. The action should have nearly severed the man's head. But there was no blood. Then, the wound healed before Hank's eyes. The monk looked disappointed, almost sorry that he didn't die. Hank backed away from the monk. What are you? he asked. He continued walking backwards until he bumped into the statue of the demon. He turned and stared up at the giant stone sculpture. It glared down at him, the fire bringing its eyes to life. Then there was a low growl, followed by an unnerving roar. Hank turned around. Where the monk had stood was now a glistening, icor colored creature. A demon, the stone gargoyle's twin, but very much alive. It reached for Hank with a giant, taloned hand. The knife fell from Hank's grasp and clattered against the stone. No! Stop! You don't have to do this! But his pleas were swallowed by the roar of thunder. Father Jorgensen pushed open the steel door and made sure it was locked securely behind him as he entered the tower. He walked down the dark corridor toward the kitchen. Ivan, it's Father Jorgensen, he shouted, his voice echoing against the cold stone. He carried a basket, which he set on the kitchen table, and began emptying. Among the contents were a small bag of flour, a packet of yeast, and a shaker of salt. Ivan entered. He paused at the entrance to the kitchen, his head bowed. Father Jorgensen noticed his distress. What is it? What's wrong? he asked. Ivan walked over to a chair where the bundle of Hank's clothes had been set. He carried them over to the table and set them down next to the bread ingredients. Father Jorgensen sighed and shook his head. Must have been whoever was driving the car I saw wrecked out on the road. Ivan nodded. And he interfered with the ritual, the priest assumed. Ivan nodded again. Father Jorgensen issued another heavy sigh. He removed a bag of blood from the basket and set it down next to the flour, salt, and yeast. It wasn't your fault. I've told the diocese a hundred times that we need a lock on the outside, too. He stuffed the bundle of clothes into the empty basket. There's nothing to be done about it now. I'll see you next week, Ivan. The priest headed back for the entrance, making sure Ivan remained in the kitchen. When he got there, he keyed in the eight-digit code that unlocked the door. It clicked and sprung open. He grabbed the door so he could slip through. The nature of the beast's imprisonment was that as long as he was inside the tower, he was confined in the persona of Ivan, a monk who had long ago made the ultimate sacrifice to enable the demon's containment. It was only on the rooftop where he could assume his true form and accept the offering that kept him at bay. The stones the building were made of were sacred, having come from an ancient cathedral in Turkey and blessed by the Pope himself. The creature was forever sealed within as long as the offerings were made, one way or another. Father Jorgensen saw the movement out of the corner of his eye a second too late. He was struck on the back of the head by a heavy wooden stool and fell unconscious to the ground. Hank placed the stool in such a way to prevent the steel door from closing. Then he took out the bundle of clothes from the basket, slipped out of the robe he was wearing, and started putting on his own clothes. Ivan peeked timidly from the kitchen door. It's okay, Hank assured him. He's out cold. The monk stared trepidatiously at the door. Hey, a deal's a deal, Hank said. I told you if you let me live, I would get you out of here. So, let's go. Hink patted the unconscious priest's pockets until he found a wallet with a bit of cash in it and a set of car keys. He smiled and pulled open the door fully, letting in a flood of sunlight. Are you coming? Ivan walked slowly toward the open door, then more quickly, pausing to drag the body of the unconscious priest with him until he was outside, staring up at the sun, his arms outstretched, reveling in his freedom. Hink followed removing the stool so the door could swing shut behind them. Do you need a ride? he asked, eyeing the old pickup parked nearby. Ivan smiled at him, then transformed into his true form. A great set of wings unfolded from his back. The demon picked up the priest in his enormous talons, then took off running and launched himself into the air. Hank watched as the creature flew away, shrinking down to just a dot in the distance. He got behind the wheel of the pickup, started the engine, 
and began driving back toward the highway, suddenly realizing that he was still very, very hungry. Thank you for listening to The Gargoyle's Bread, written especially for the Bedtime Stories for Insomniac's fiction podcast by Rich Hosek. Please remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast app, rate us on Apple, Spotify, and Audible, and share these stories with anyone who enjoys audiobooks. Speaking of audiobooks, if you're a fan of the paranormal, the audio version of Near Death, a rainy day investigation, is currently available on this very podcast. You can find an entertaining review by Tom Baker on the One Hour Book Club podcast. If you're looking for other original story podcasts, check out asreadbyme.com. They have an eclectic mix of fiction, poetry, and essays that are sure to keep you entertained, all read by the authors. Thanks again, and all the very best.